Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, moving Hawaii forward. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. Today we will talk about rush hour traffic during the hours of 6 to 10 in the morning. Our gridlock is due to the fact that everyone is trying to get on the road at the same time, trying to either get to work or to school. The question is, should employers or the University of Hawaii have an obligation to be part of the traffic solution? Since 1991, Washington State employers were asked to do just that, be a part of the traffic solution. The Washington State Commute Reduction Law was passed by the legislature to address major employers in the state who employed over 100 full-time employees and those employees that arrived to the work site between the hours of 6 and 9 in the morning. Today's show will look at what employers have done over the years to address and improve rush hour traffic. With me today, representing one of those employers, is Mike Wash, director at the Boeing Company. Mike, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. Mike, you, um, you've been with Boeing for quite a few years, and in the past, you actually were responsible for the Boeing commute, commute program. And um, a part of that was um, handling everything from all the program elements to interacting with the legislature to interacting with all the jurisdictions in the various cities where Boeing had its, uh, its sites. So let me ask you the first question. Um, you've been, Boeing's been at this for a long time, uh, involved with employees' commutes to all, all the Boeing sites, be it down in Renton, where the old, you know, the old Boeing um, warplanes were produced, or up in Everett, where the 777 was produced, or is still produced. Um, would you tell me, kind of, tell me a little bit of history in its Boeing commute program? Sure, Tim. So Boeing actually started our first van pool rideshare program right after the United States entered World War II. And the reason we had to do that was at that time, most of the men were away fighting in the war, and most of the employees in our factories were female. And due to the scarcity of fuel and a lot of other factors, they set up a, the very first van pool program. So it was actually set up in 1941 and became the forerunner because even after the war ended, people liked it. And so we always had a pretty core group of employees who wanted to keep that program alive. And it, it stayed along for probably, well, through the 40s and 50s. And then into the late 60s, it became a little more organized. And in the 70s, we actually bought our own fleet of vans. And they were assigned to employees based on where they worked. And a van captain would be appointed who would be responsible for driving everybody to work. And it remained pretty much intact through uh, the late 80s when the Boeing company wanted to get out of the maintenance of that fleet because it was pretty labor intensive and we actually granted the remaining 99 vehicles to King County Metro. That's, that's wild. So before um, the Washington State enacted the uh, Washington State Commute Trip Reduction Law back in 1991, you guys had a 40 to 50 year head start on them. Well, it was out of necessity. You know, we needed to keep the, the military aircraft coming out of the factories at a furious pace. And we also had to keep our female employees happy and showing up to work rested and, and ready to go to work and hit the ground running because, you know, as you can imagine, work was pretty intense back then because it was a national effort to win a war. Right. Um, but one of the things that we learned even back then is they arrived better rested. It saved them money and they hit the ground running as soon as they got through the gates of the factory. So that mindset really, really stayed with us pretty much forever and is still here today. Yeah, you, you just hit on a really important point. In fact, I was leading into my, my next question to you is that when you're in gridlock and you're by yourself, you know, it's kind of assumed that you have the radio on, maybe you're listening to music and, you know, for whatever reason, um, some folks out there think that could be rather relaxing. But really, it's, it's really stressful because you have to, you know, step on your brake at a moment's notice and that's not relaxing, that's just stress-filled for the entire time you're on the roadway, bumper to bumper. So um, the fact that people were arriving to work and building planes that won the war, um, probably had a chance to either take a little nap before work or just relax or, or do whatever. Well, they did, Tim, and in today's modern world, it's even more uh, remarkable because what they tell us is that while they're in their van or their carpool or riding the bus or riding the train from South uh, County all the way up you know, to, the, to, to uh, 
Everett, mm -hmm. they have a chance to get in their laptop and work on email and, you know, relax on social media, check up on Facebook, do things that they can't do if they're driving because they don't have to concentrate. Oh, that's a good point, Mike. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, well, you just mentioned some of them, some of the positive impacts of the Boeing program. Did you see other positive impacts uh, that the Boeing transportation program had with its employees? Um, I think some were financial, but uh, other maybe intangible aspects? Well, we did, and it actually, it actually uh, created a situation where we built upon the things that they told us that they wanted to continue which was showing up, being able to, you know, not have to worry about the cost and expense of maintaining a vehicle for commuting, um, but also being able to arrive at work rested. So as a result of that, we started these employee service centers where they could bring some dry cleaning and drop it off and have it delivered back to the workplace. Um, we beefed up our cafeteria system probably tenfold so that they could stay at work, get a nutritious meal at, at re reasonable cost, and not even have to leave. And all of those things are things that they told us that they wanted to augment the commuter assistance program. And those things are still in existence today. They're working quite well. So I didn't even know that. I didn't know that was a part of your regular commute trip reduction program. That sounds like something that Boeing took the time and money to expand upon. And I don't even remember you guys counting that for um, official recognition. We didn't. It's an evolution. The bottom line is if they show up to work and they're well rested, and they're eager to put in a, a really good productive day at work, we win as a company because a happy employee is a more productive employee. Well, let's talk about employers and kind of the nature of this show, and that is um, employers' involvement with trying to be part of the solution with gridlock, and particularly gridlock during the rush hour. Um, back in 1991, Mike, as you well know, Washington State was trying to address the, uh, clean, uh, the Federal Clean Air Act and rather than uh, employ impunitive me measures against uh, employers, particularly those that had um, more of an industrial nature behind them, they addressed the other part of the equation. That was um, what were the emissions from uh, automobiles. And so as a result, in 1991, Washington State passed the commute trip reduction law. And the law, as you know, Mike, was addressed for, uh, to address those employers that employed 100 employees or more uh, full time that arrived at the work site between 6 and 9 in the morning and um, arrived uh, 52 weeks out of the year, minus vacation. So, um, remember those days, Mike? And uh, what was your recollection about what Boeing was doing just before the implementation of the law and then when the law was enacted by the legislature? Well, it's interesting you brought that up because we started our subsidy before the law was enacted because even back in the late 80s there was some talk that something was going to be formalized and you don't ever want to be the holdout for something that's good for the region and you know since Boeing had already had its vanpool fleet we were used to doing stuff that helped our employees but we really honestly didn't pay much attention to what it did for the region and what it did was it took cars off the road and that just speeds up everybody commute time so you know, it, it's not only a good idea for our employees, but it's also a good idea for the company because being such a large employer, we can get blamed for a lot of things. And why be known for being part of the problem with traffic congestion when you can be a huge part of the solution? So in 89, there was a young gentleman, a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young professional named Robert Throckmorton, who approached me when I was named as the first Boeing Commuter Assistance Program Manager. And he, he suggested that we, we think about a subsidy. And so what we did before we actually formalized it is we, we picked a couple of uh, bus routes from South King County up into the Seattle area, and we offered them a temporary subsidy for six months to see what would happen. And Bob said, we've got to provide bait. And I said, well, what do you mean by bait? We're giving them a subsidy. And he said, no, 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 we need to give them food. And I said, like, what? And he said, well, they're going to be getting up early to get on these buses. so. We, we bought a whole bunch of donuts, and Bob and I went down to the Kent Space Center at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we had a full bus. And we didn't really know what to do because we ran out of donuts. And I said, you know, Bob, I think we've got something here. It built and built and built, and we kept up the donuts and the, the temporary subsidy for a, a couple months. And then finally we thought, okay, we've got to formalize this. 
So I was able to sell it to my superiors and they thought, let's continue it on a test basis. And then the company bought it off and went company wide in 1990. And we started off with $15 and then it grew to $25 a month subsidy. And then I guess because the state was impressed with some of the efforts we had made, uh, Booth Gardner named me to that commuter production task force. Yeah, I remember that. So Mike, what I'm hearing here is that potentially um, the improvement of traffic here in, on Oahu, specifically in Honolulu, may be the power of malasadas. <laughs> malasadas or whatever other treats or pastry people want. Maybe some spam musubi. Um, four in the morning is a little bit too early for me, but um, maybe not for <laughs> some others. But um, well, Mike, um, let's talk about some of the basic elements of commute trip reduction law and, and some of the obligations that employers technically were required to participate with. And that was, number one, to appoint an employee transportation coordinator, uh, someone who is identified at the work site as to be the focal person of employees' questions or comments about um, commute and or their uh, transportation benefits. Uh, they were required to create a program that addressed a number of elements. Um, initially, it wasn't many, but Boeing already had theirs in place, or, or some of them in place, that would provide incentives and, and, and incentives enough for the employee to consider leaving the car in the driveway and getting on public transportation or carpool or, or something like that um, to avoid that single occupancy vehicle trip on the freeway. They're also required to advertise the program once a year. And I know you guys did a lot of work marketing your program. It's, marketing is never a, a task that's ever completed. It's ongoing and I know Boeing spent a lot of time and resources uh, doing just that. And then last, um, some of the basic things they're required to do is every two years, and this was a big issue for Boeing, uh, every two years they're required to survey all their affected employees that um, arrive between six and nine in the morning. Do you remember those days, Mike? I remember them very well, like they were yesterday. Um, which one was the particular challenge? I, I'm going to guess it was uh, trying to survey. I think at the time, in 1991, 92, Boeing and just in the Puget Sound region had somewhere upwards to 105 to 107,000 employees. That didn't include contractors. Yeah, actually, it was it was closer to 200,000 back then. It was incredible. Um, that's a lot. But, of that's a lot of surveys. Yeah, well, the reason why we couldn't survey at that time was because of our union rules. Every person who would be taken away from their factory job or their guest job would have had to have filled out a Salco card and had a job number to charge to. And that's just the way that our relationship with the unions worked. Mm -hmm. And so we realized it would have been cost prohibitive to actually open up everybody to fill out a survey. So we lobbied the local municipalities to allow us to do alternative data. And I remember I invited them all in to our own internal or commuter committee, and they all sat around the table and we discussed what we were gonna do, and we had to make sure that we proved it to their satisfaction that it would in fact provide useful data. And they agreed that it would. And a lot of the reasons why it would is because we had so many people that the sample size was valid. You know, it probably would be a lot harder if you have 25 employees, but we had, you know, six figures worth of employees. And so they, they bought that off and then that worked for quite a while and then later on the company figured out a way to actually do a survey and they do that now. But that was a major hurdle and I think that that was a real feather in all of our caps. You know, Boeing's, other private uh, employers and also the, the public transit agencies for putting aside the expectation that we had to do the survey and understanding that we had some unique challenges and allowing us to do alternative data at that time. Right. Okay, well, Mike, um, I... hang on to that thought. We're going to take a quick break, and then I want to address some of the value of, of establishing a baseline of what employees are doing, and then after the efforts of a commute trip reduction program, um, getting either alternative data or survey data to see how you measure progress. So um, we're going to be right back. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and this is Moving Hawaii Forward. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii over the coming weeks and the alternative fuel supply chains necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. We are going to invite in and we will have 
significant interviews with various stakeholders, including our producers, which are our farmers and our scientists, our conversion technologies, including Terviva, who we'll see in two weeks, as well as our consumers. Uh, within there, we're also going to have the investor groups necessary to make sure that this uh, can advance. So I do hope you join us as we explore our deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii. Welcome back. I'm Tim Apicella, and this is Moving Hawaii Forward. Today we're talking about employer programs and how they are trying to help reduce and be part of the solution to uh, traffic problems here in Honolulu. With me today is Mike Wash. He's director of the Boeing Company. And Mike, um, we were just talking before the break about um, surveying employees or uh, gathering alternative data. And um, do you, I know that was a real pain for all employers in the Seattle, Puget Sound area and even across the state in the Spokane area. Um, do you think ultimately that was a worthwhile effort and did, was, was there something to be gained from all that, uh, all the data? Well, there was, Tim, because we needed to establish a baseline. And one of the things that, that gave us a bit of a head start was because we did start our subsidy earlier in 1990. And so we had done our first baseline survey in 90, um, not an employee survey, but I guess you'd call it more of a site-by-site -site transportation audit to see who was uh, either getting a bus pass and getting it subsidized, who was in a van pool, who was in a carpool, and then assess that against the site population and their shift. The bulk of the people, even to this day, are still on first shift, which is gonna start anywhere from 5.30 in the morning up to 9.30 in the morning, depending on you know, your individual micro shift within the first shift. Mm -hmm. But enough of that technical crap. The bottom line is we had to give them data that made sense and, and was valid. And we were able to, to bring them in and we sat down and had a very long, very uh, heated session. I mean, it did become you know, a, a pretty heated session because they wanted it done one way and we couldn't do it that way. So we had to approach them as partners. And, you know, being the largest employer in the region, people tend to call us the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And I wanted to make sure that we didn't maintain that reputation because without King County Metro, without Kitsap Transit and Community Transit and Pierce Transit and all of our partners, we would not be successful because we had to do a lot of specialty bus lines. In fact, we had a lot of them with the King County Metro. We called them custom buses back then where we would have a population that needed to get from their home turf to their work site. And we would pay Metro under contract a certain amount of money to make sure that those buses operated depending on Boeing site needs. And they did it. Right. Um, yes, we had to put a little bit of money up front, but if we didn't have the partnership, they wouldn't have even attempted that. So I think that it, you know, it, it really is important to keep in mind that the public and the private sector have got to work together because if they don't, then everybody's hackles get raised and people go back to their office and they think they're not listening to us. And that's the worst thing that could happen because you haven't taken anybody out of traffic that way. Well, Mike, you're raising a really great point because I'd, I'd love to see employers get more involved with programs such as what Boeing has or Microsoft all the major employers in the Puget Sound area, Seattle area. Um, there seems to be a reluctance of the legislature to involve employers. I'm sure they, they think that they have enough to do as it is, and adding one more regulatory act uh, to their plate would probably be, uh, maybe it's gonna be excessive. But that was the success of commute trip reduction that still continues to be the success of commute trip reduction law, is the cooperative partnership between the agencies that are required to implement it versus the employees that are required to adhere to the law. And without that partnership and um, assistance from uh, folks from all the different agencies and, and grant dollars from various agencies, I'm not sure the program would have been successful. I remember back in the early 90s, there was something called Reg 15 in California that had very strict uh, regulatory mandates to all employers in California. And it was a horrendous law, um, involved financial penalties of twenty, twenty-five thousand uh, dollars I think there was even mention of jail time for CEOs that failed to comply with the law, and it was a nightmare. And ultimately, President Clinton uh, repealed that law. And so it was um, amazing that 
commute trip reduction law was passed in the legislature given the horrible experience in California. Do you recall the, the days when uh, it was just coming out that the legislature was going to pass this law that would affect not only the Boeing company but every other major employer in the Puget Sound area? I do because I got a lot of calls from people at other companies around here. In fact, I got mildly headhunted by Microsoft to go over and, and start their program. Mm -hmm. um, I declined, which was probably not a, a smart move on my part because I would have been retired as a multimillionaire stock option guy. <laughs> but after 30 years at Boeing, I, I'm glad I stayed here too. That's good. Uh, you know, it, you know, one thing that happened, Tim, is when I was named to that task force. I really, to this day, consider it a real feather in my company's cap, in my personal cap, and in people like yourself who I work with on the public side, because we never approached it as an adversarial relationship. I mean, really, that's a silly way to go, because we all live here. And, you know, it, the people living in the Honolulu area and all over Oahu, they all live there, but they have to work together to solve that problem, because I know what that traffic's like. I've driven from Makakilo to Waikiki. I know what that, that nightmare can be like, but people have got to talk, they've got to come together, and they've got to find a mutual solution. And the employer can play a huge role. And they've got to find that, that gentle balance of you know, public help, uh, public specialists who can work with the employer in the employer's language. Because I've had people approach me with, you know, a verbal hammer and tell me that I had to do stuff. And I worked for a pretty cranky old guy, if you remember, Mr. Alan Ashworth, and he would I not do. listen to them. And so I'd say, okay, well, Alan, let's try this. And I basically had to go rogue a few times and try some stuff that he may not have liked. And maybe he's even listening to this. I think he's about 88 years old now, but uh, he's probably listening. <laughs> and uh, so when we started that subsidy and then we started the custom bus lines we started getting some local notice and a couple of awards and then we got something to brag about it's like see alan this is a good thing and then he loosened his grip and let me have the free reign to work deals with you and throckmorton and other people to get more people out of their cars and then when i was appointed to that task force you know, people made a couple cracks up front. They thought I was going to walk in there as the Boeing guy and start telling everybody what to do. And I remember one guy said, you know, we're going to knock you out of your ivory tower, come out down off of your high horse. But to make a long story short, after two years of that, they nominated me to run the policy and guidelines subcommittee. And it was a 23-person task force. Seventeen of those people were on my subcommittee. And then they gave me an award in, I think, I think 99. I remember that. I had to fly to Spokane um, for my work helping the state, you know, mitigate traffic congestion. So that's something I'm really proud of. And if, if there's one little soundbite I could give, that would be to make sure that you've got people over there in the public sector who can work with the private sector in their own language. Yes. Don't go after them with a verbal hammer. Go after them with partnership and with a real willingness to help them solve the problem. I'm glad you gave that sound bit because I'll never forget on um, some administrative um, executives from the EPA uh, came up to me and said, how is it that you are approaching these employers and getting the successes you are getting with trip reduction? And my answer was very, very simple. It's about establishing trust that as an agency, be it my agency or any other uh, public transit agency, we're not there to hit the employer over the head with a, a regulatory hammer but it's establishing trust and being involved as a partner as we all move forward trying to reduce traffic. And that's a point I'd, I'd love to make to the legislature here in Hawaii, to the city and county, uh, to the mayor's office, is that we can make a difference, but we can't go about it in a regulatory, uh, heavy-handed um, methodology. It has to be cooperative, and, and quite frankly, both, both sides have to see it's in their best interest to employ some of these strategies. We don't have a lot of time left, Mike, but I'm just going to go down a very quick uh, cursory list of what employers can do to help their employees um, make the commute a lot easier and or just leave their car in the driveway. As you've already said, Boeing Company has offered uh, subsidies for transit, for, for the bus, uh, for rail, for van pools. Uh, employers could also offer subsidies for carpools. Uh, that may not be tax deductible, but um, it's, uh, well, actually, I think it is now in Washington State. I think they are now looking at carpools. 
Employers can make subsidies available for those who bike to work, who walk to work. They can provide um, a program that was called Guaranteed Ride Home, and I think Boeing did this, Mike. I think you guys partook, partook in this, where you ensure uh, in a given calendar year that an employee may be eligible for a taxi ride home. Just in case if uh, one of the children were called sick and they have to go to the doctor and we have a parent at the, uh, at the company that says, I, I need to get home and I left my car in the driveway, so what do I do? Well, I'm gonna get a, a guaranteed ride home and via a taxi ride. So there's guaranteed ride home programs. Um, there's something that Boeing put, uh, participated in, and I think you guys removed thousands and thousands of trips off the road, and that was a, um, a tele telework commuting program. Uh, you wanna step in real quick about that, Mike, and tell me about that? You bet, because I myself participate in it. I'm an executive in this company, and every Friday I work virtually from my home office to reduce two trips to and from work that day. So even though I'm not actively engaged in that program any, anymore, I still do my part. You know, Tim, the, the funny thing is, is that if an employer engages in a commute trip production program for their people, their people are going to have three benefits. They're going to be happier and less stressed. Let's roll that into one benefit. They're going to be more productive, and they save money. But the employer has an enhanced reputation because now they're seen as part of the solution and not part of the ongoing problem. That's a good point, Mike. I mean, it's such a it's such a win win. It's it's almost silly. It's a great point, Mike. We have got about only about a minute left, and I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, here in Hawaii, things are different. Um, you know, we don't have a regulatory uh, hammer to employ, and thank goodness we don't. Do you think there uh, would be? an advantage for employers here in the Honolulu area that uh, would either on a voluntary basis or even regulatory. Um, how do you think they would perceive um, the state and the city asking them to participate in, in the efforts to reduce traffic? Well, if they were asked, they would probably have a favorable reaction. If they were told, they would probably have a negative reaction. Well, and maybe they, they should be given an opportunity to step up to the plate because the state may be surprised at how many of them want to comply. Think about it. I mean, the traffic over there is getting worse every single day. And if a company had, let's just say there was a voluntary program and the company could have a sticker in their front window of their office that said, we're part of, you know, Honolulu traffic reduction or whatever it's called, it's almost like being a green company in the Pacific Northwest. It's something that they can point to and say, look, we're trying to help the situation. We're not part of the problem. We're trying to be part of the solution. Well, I it think can evolve. It can start out voluntary, and then it can become regulatory, or at least voluntary with some measures so they can see the actual progress. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Mike. And I appreciate your time today. That's, that's all the time we have for today. So, Mike, thank you, and I appreciate the Boeing Company taking the time out to appear on this show. That's Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella, and we'll see you next Tuesday.